All right. Welcome. Uh, welcome, everyone, to uh, whatever this is going to turn out to be, if it turns out to be anything at all. And uh, let's see. How about let's get some light on here so you can see my beautiful face. Not too much light, though. We don't want it to look incredibly washed out. I think that'll work. Let's see what happens if we go one more. That's good. And now it's not blinking in my eye, causing me to have a seizure, which is always uh, appreciated. But anyway, uh, welcome. And uh, what we are here to do is listen to a speech that was given earlier today by the United States Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, because apparently, and I didn't discover this until I was going through my Twitter feed this morning as uh, has become somewhat of a habit and or ritual, uh, however you want to describe it. And I stumbled upon a post from Reuters. Apparently there was a meeting from, uh, or a meeting of NATO this week and Secretary A. Blinken was in attendance at that meeting. As soon as it concluded, he gave remarks to the press that was assembled uh, outside of the location that that meeting was taking place. And I thought it might be interesting for us to take a listen to that speech because I, I'm just going to make some wild speculation here and say that you're not likely to see this anywhere else uh, on the mainstream media outlets. And if you do, they're probably just taking 15, 20, 30 second excerpts from the speech itself to be able to frame it in such a way as to present whatever case it is that they're trying to make to you. So again, in the interest of historical context, why don't we take a look at this particular speech as a tension in the Eastern European region of the world seems to be ratcheting up at an ever increasing pace every single day. Uh, something tells me that this meeting that was taking place for NATO was about more than just, um, you know, procedural administration and that sort of thing. It appears based on the trends that are pervasive in the media at the moment uh, that we are headed towards some sort of extended uh, armed conflict in that particular region. So let's find out what the secretary has for us today. Like Finland, it's militarily capable. It's a strong democracy, fully dedicated to upholding the commitments and values that underpin our alliance, including Article 5. At the NATO Leaders Summit last summer, uh, the NATO allies agreed on a new strategy for the first time in a decade. Since then, including at this ministerial, we've been working to implement that strategy, making our alliance stronger, more resilient, better positioned for the future. We're building on the Wales Defense Investment Pledge to invest 2% of our GDP in defense. It is critical that we have the means to replenish stockpiles, to increase the readiness of our forces, to meet force generation commitments for NATO missions and operations, to keep pace with 21st century challenges. We're developing new partnerships, including in the Indo-Pacific. At this ministerial, we welcome the participation of Japan, Australia, South Korea, New Zealand, who share our vision of a free and open Indo-Pacific region, but also recognize that many of the challenges that we face are interconnected and global in nature. Interesting that he chose to highlight Japan as one of those partners, considering that Japan has just made the decision to start trading for oil in uh, digital yuan, as opposed to the old standard petrodollar. I wonder if this is maybe some foreshadowing about, mm, I don't know, maybe sanctions that may await Japan in the future. Let's keep listening. And of course, the alliance remains relentlessly focused on Russia's aggression against Ukraine. 
the NATO-Ukraine Commission met for the first time in five years with Foreign Minister Kaleva's participation to talk about ways that we can continue to help Ukraine in the weeks, the months, and indeed the years ahead. When the uh, NATO foreign ministers last convened back in November of last year, President Putin was pursuing his new strategy to win his brutal war against Ukraine. Having suffered devastating setbacks on the battlefield, he tried to bomb and freeze Ukraine's civilian population into submission. He accelerated his campaign to weaponize energy against Ukraine's European partners so that they would decide that the costs of supporting the country were too high. And he continued to try to raise food and energy prices in some of the poorest countries in the world to manufacture a false choice between supporting Ukraine and making ends meet for their people. You know, that's, it's interesting that they keep putting out this notion that the military action that has been taken by Russia has somehow further impoverished the population of that country especially when all evidence that I have seen so far coming from actual people who live in that region, uh, both in Ukraine as well as in Poland and Germany, uh, in some of the other smaller Eastern European countries, as well as the people in Russia, uh, when you take all of those firsthand accounts and you smash them all up together and take a look at the overall picture, What seems to be emerging as far as trends go is that the Russian people and the Russian economy has actually gotten stronger as a result of all the action that has been taken against it by the international community or hmm, should we say by the rules based international community because that kind of seems to be the dialectic that's being set up here, the old rules-based order against the new multipolar order. But I tell you, I'm probably just reading way too much into that. Let's, uh, let's listen to a little bit more. President Putin has failed, thanks to the remarkable courage and bravery of the Ukrainian people and unprecedented support from Ukraine's partners, Ukraine endures. More than 50 countries have been providing security assistance. Dozens of countries jumped in to help Ukraine defend and repair its energy grid in the face of Russia's onslaught. We sustained and increased the pressure on Russia with unprecedented sanctions and export controls, which are having a dramatic and growing impact. The Kremlin's usable financial reserves are plummeting. Its budget revenues from oil and gas have been cut in half since last year. Hundreds, even more than a thousand companies have fled the country and aren't coming back. Hundreds of thousands of young people have fled Russia, literally Russia's future. We've demonstrated again our unity of purpose and our unity of action. And after this ministerial, I am confident that that will endure for as long as it takes for Ukraine to defend its sovereignty, its territorial integrity, its independence. Uh, Yesterday, the United States announced our 35th drawdown of arms and equipment. That includes more ammunition for HIMARS, air defense interceptors, and artillery rounds, as well as anti-armor systems, small arms, heavy equipment transport vehicles, and maintenance support. These contributions will continue to enable Ukraine to protect civilian infrastructure from missile and drone attacks and to hold and retake Ukraine's territory. The United States and Ukraine's partners support meaningful diplomatic efforts that can achieve a peace, but not just any kind of peace. It has to be a just peace that upholds the principles of the UN Charter, sovereignty, territorial integrity, independence, and it has to be a durable peace that ensures that Russia can't simply rest and refit its troops and then relaunch the war at a time of its choosing. That's the kind of peace, a just and durable one, that 141 countries at the United Nations General Assembly endorsed just a few weeks ago. Until that peace is achieved, The United States, together with allies and partners from around the world, will continue to provide the assistance that Ukraine needs to defend its territory and defend its people. Question. Was one of those 141 countries Wakanda? Uh, The story of NATO over the last year has been one of unity and resolve. Amid new challenges to our values, to a rules-based order, 
to our collective security, our alliance has emerged stronger than ever and now larger than ever. As we prepare for Vilnius and beyond, I'm confident that we'll continue to meet the challenges of this moment and the time to come. So with that, happy to take some questions. We'll first go to Vivian Salama with the Wall Street Journal. Vivian. Thank you so much. Thanks, Mr. Secretary. Um, I want to ask you about my colleague, Evan Gorskovich, who as of today has been detained in Russia for the last year, uh, for the last week, sorry. Do you, it feels like a year. Um, do you anticipate that you will approve uh, a designation of wrongfully detained for Evan, um, or do you need to wait however long it will take for the Russians to agree to grant him consular access um, for that to even happen? And secondly, uh, prisoner swaps have occurred in recent years to bring a number of detained Americans home. Is there anyone that the Russians want or would be willing to exchange either for Evan or for Paul Whelan, who's also being held on espionage charges? And more broadly, are you concerned that there is a precedent being set now by our adversaries who are detaining Americans in the hope that maybe they would get um, some sort of prisoner swap in return? Thank you. Thanks very much, Vivian. Uh, first, and you've heard me say this before, um, from my perspective, from the department's perspective, there is no higher priority than the safety and security of American citizens around the world, and that includes those who may be wrongfully detained, held hostage, uh, otherwise kept from coming home, being with their families. Um, in Evan's case, we are working through the determination uh, on uh, wrongful detention, and there's a process to do that, and it's something that we're working through very deliberately, uh, but uh, expeditiously as well. Um, and I'll let that process play out. In my own mind, there's no doubt that he's being wrongfully detained uh, by Russia, which is exactly what I said to Foreign Minister Lavrov when I spoke to him uh, over the weekend and uh, insisted that uh, Evan be released immediately. Um, but I want to make sure that as always, because there is a formal process that we go through it, and we will, and I expect that to be, uh, to be completed soon. Um, more broadly, when it comes, first of all, to, to, to Paul Whelan, as I've also said, uh, there's a proposal on the table that's been on the table for some months. Again, with Foreign Minister Lavrov, I reiterated that Russia should um, move on that proposal so that we can bring uh, Paul home. In any of these instances, um, there is a balance to be done between trying to bring home people who are being unjustly detained in one way or another and what it takes to do that. Um, I believe that, as we've demonstrated in the past, uh, and as a result as well of legislation that we have and other tools that we have, that even as we engage in efforts to bring people home, we can also uh, increase the pressure and increase the penalties on those who would engage in the practice of unlawful um, arbitrary detention of America. All right, so I'm going to interrupt him there uh, as he's talking about the unlawful detention of Americans. So for folks who are not aware, according to Wikipedia, Paul Nicholas Whalen, born March 5th, 1970, uh, so about six years older than my sister, is a Canadian-born former United States Marine with U.S., British, Irish, and Canadian citizenship. Interesting. He, has, he holds citizenship simultaneously in three different countries. Hmm. Actually, it looks like it might be four or five. If he was U.S., he was a U.S. Marine and Canadian-born. Anyway, he was arrested in Russia on December 28th, 2018 and accused of spying. On June 15th, 2020, he received a 16-year prison sentence. And, of course, Wikipedia has uh, plenty of other information about this gentleman. Let's see. Although they don't do a very good job of encapsulating it. So I'm going to take a wild guess. Oh, here we go. A little bit further down. This was uh, on his arrest in Russia 
former CIA officers have stated that the CIA would not recruit an officer with Whalen's military record, nor leave an officer exposed without a diplomatic passport. Sure, they wouldn't, uh, unless it benefited them in some form or fashion to do that. Uh, the CIA further claims that Whalen's arrest is connected to tensions between Russia and the United States, including the detention of confessed unregistered foreign agent Maria Butina. On December 20th, 2018, when discussing Butina's arrest, Russian President Vladimir Putin stated that Russia will not arrest innocent pe people simply to exchange them. Hmm. I wonder who that was availed shot at. I don't know. Maybe Abe Lincoln will tell us. Let's keep listening. American citizens. Uh, and that's what we've been doing, including, for example, implementing the Robert Levinson Act and other tools that we have. We'll next go to Vitaly Siza with Freedom TV. Thank you. I have one question. Uh, yesterday, after meeting with you, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Ukraine said that he wanted to see some proposal from NATO during the Vilnius summit. Today, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Estonia said that uh, he, Ukraine should be provided with a road map of accession to NATO. What are your thoughts about this process? Which proposal could expect to get Ukraine during the Vilnius summit? Thank you. Our focus right now is relentlessly on doing what needs to be done to help Ukraine defend itself against the Russian aggression and indeed to put it in a, help put it in a position to retake more of the territory that's been seized um, from it by Russia. That's our in intense focus. We're also looking at what we can do over a longer period of time to build up Ukraine's capacity to deter aggression, to defend against aggression, and if necessary, again in the future, to defeat aggression. And a big part of that is bringing Ukraine up to, to NATO standards and to uh, NATO uh, interoperability. And I suspect that um, you'll see that focus continue at the Vilnius summit. I don't want to get uh, ahead of the summit, but we are very focused on these very practical steps that can be taken and need to continue to be taken to bring Ukraine up to, to NATO standards, of course. So this next summit that they plan to hold, uh, apparently from what Secretary Blinken is indicating about the interoperability of NATO and Ukraine is something that will get hammered out at the next NATO meeting in Vilnius. I'll let him keep flapping his gums and I'll try and uh, see if they have let us know exactly when that's going to be. Of course, NATO's door remain open, remains open. Uh, there's, no ch there's no change in that, but we have to be, in this moment, focused intensely on the weeks uh, and months ahead, particularly as Ukraine prepares for a counteroffensive, again, to try to retake more of its territory, as well as work that needs to be done to continue to bring Ukraine up to NATO standards and NATO interoperability. We'll next go to Kylie Atwood with CNN. All right, so I did find an answer. That Next summit is set to take place on July 11th and 12th of this year, 2023. So just about three months from now, uh, which in the business world is a quarter. You make business plans for quarters. Uh, just making observations, folks. I'm not, not drawing any conclusions there. Hi, Secretary. Thank you for doing this. Um, it was a momentous week here, but there's a lot going on at home, so I have a few questions for you. Um, bear with me. Um, in terms of what happened here, obviously you said that NATO has become stronger this week with Finland joining, but how tangibly will Ukraine benefit from Finland joining NATO? And then my second two questions have to do with what is happening at home. Um, first, President Tsai of Taiwan is meeting with Speaker McCarthy today in California. Do you support this meeting at this time? And how concerned are you about China already vowing that it will retaliate? And then my second question has to do with politics at home. Yesterday, the world watched as former President Trump was arrested. He's now the first 
current or former president to face criminal charges, and he's running for re-election to be president. Have any of your allies asked you about this while you've been here at NATO? And what's your response to revived concerns among allies that many of us have heard about the long-term reliability of the United States given the polarized nature of politics at home? Thank you. Um, Kylie, la last question first. Um, as you know well, I don't do I don't do politics. I can tell you though that uh, the question you raised uh, about uh, the um, proceedings in, in New York actually did not come up in my conversations with uh, NATO colleagues. Nor did I get questions about uh, the uh, durability of our uh, of our approach. I think people are very focused on what we're actually doing. So wait a minute. Is he trying to tell us that the rest of the world is not nearly as deranged by this orange man as the American media seems to be? That's kind of what I'm getting from it. Your results may vary. Uh, and what we're doing is a lot, including what I just went through uh, in terms of the um, outcomes from this ministerial, the preparations for the Leader Summit uh, in Vilnius, the intense focus on everything we're doing to support Ukraine, to implement the new strategic concept for NATO. Uh, that's what everyone was talking about and focused on. And also, as I mentioned, the fact that we have the, the growing engagement between NATO and other partners, to include our partners from the Indo-Pacific, to include the European Union. Its high representative was here as well uh, today. That was the entirety of the, uh, the conversation and, uh, and our focus. Um, in terms of uh, Finland's membership in, in NATO and, uh, and Ukraine, um, look, in the first instance, irrespective of, the, uh, of that question, as I've detailed uh, at, at some length, uh, a big focus of our meetings here over the last day, day and a half was on, uh, on Ukraine and the support that um, virtually every NATO member is providing individually as well as the support that NATO institutionally is providing both uh, in the immediate and also looking toward the, um, the Vilnius summit. I mentioned a moment ago um, work that the Alliance uh, looks to do to help continue to bring Ukraine up to NATO standards, NATO interoperability. Uh, and I think that's something you'll see featured uh, at, the, um, uh, at the Leader Summit. Finland's um, membership in NATO uh, does two things. It, uh, as I've said, makes Finland safer because one of the things that resulted from Russia's aggression against Ukraine was deep and growing concern among a number of countries that they could be next. And um, that created what I think is truly a historic sea change in both Finland and Sweden seeking membership in NATO and thus seeking to benefit from its uh, Article 5 um, guarantees. And I'm sure that that was not a part of the strategy when it came to the encroachment by NATO upon the borders of Russia over the course of the last mm, 25 years or so. No, probably wasn't a part of the thinking at all. Uh, so Finland now benefits from that. But Finland also makes the alliance as a whole stronger. And that's important in and of itself. I think it uh, may have some additional benefits in the sense that um, to the extent Russia thinks about um, expanding or broadening its aggression, uh, the deterrent that NATO poses to that has now become even stronger. Uh, NATO is a defensive alliance. It's not uh, seeking to uh, engage in conflict with Russia, uh, but it's a defensive alliance that has to have a strong deterrent precisely because we want to make sure that countries think twice, think three times, and then don't engage in, in aggression. And I think Finland will, as membership in the alliance, adds to uh, NATO's deterrent strength and, if necessary, its defensive strength. Um, with regard to President Tsai's transit of, uh, of the United States, um, I think the first thing to emphasize is that these um, transits by high-level uh, Taiwanese authorities are nothing new. Um, they're private, they're unofficial, but they've been going on for years, and uh, President Tsai and uh, her predecessors 
uh, have, uh, have done the same thing. Uh, in fact, every Taiwan president has um, transited the United States uh, at one point uh, or another. Um, the uh, meetings, the uh, engagements that the president has also are very much in line with, uh, with precedent. And similarly, our own approach to Taiwan has remained very consistent and unchanged, including our adherence to the One China policy, uh, guided by the Taiwan Relations Act, the three communiques, the six assurances, our opposition to any unilateral changes in the status quo by, by either side. So it's a long way of saying that um, given that, Beijing should not use the transits as a, an excuse to take any actions to ratchet up tensions. Understand that when he uses the word excuse there, it is being done deliberately. Most human beings have a very specific connotation that is attached to that word excuse. And when you use it, it communicates a very specific definition. He could have also used the word reason. He could have used the word provocation. There are a multitude of other words that he could have used, but he chose that one specifically because it fit the concept that he wanted to get across to the audience and place in their minds as justification for any future action that might need to be taken on behalf of the United States because of that excuse. Moving on. Uh, to um, further push at uh, changing the status quo. Um, and our, our objective remains the same, to have peace, to have stability uh, across the Taiwan Strait, uh, and to ensure that any differences that exist between um, mainland and uh, Taiwan are resolved uh, peacefully. Uh, and apologies if there are any construction noises uh, bleeding through the audio. I can't do anything about that. Sorry, folks. Final question, Ricard Husu with, from YLE. Thanks for taking my question. Uh, a follow-up on Finland. How do you see that Finland will... Uh, strengthen the alliance uh, and you see that this decision to join uh, can uh, also strengthen the ties, bilateral ties between the US and Finland, for instance, in regard to a future defense cooperation agreement. Thank you. Thanks very much. Well, the uh, bilateral ties between the United States and Finland are already extraordinarily strong, um, but I think uh, Finland's membership in the alliance can uh, if it does anything, will only, uh, will only strengthen those ties, as well as Finland's ties, to uh, all the other members of, uh, of NATO. Um, but as I said before, what fin Finland brings to this enterprise is a country that has um, very strong military capacity, and equally important uh, is um, a, a strong and vital democracy. And so both in terms of advancing the interests that bring NATO countries together and the values that we share, Finland is um, a very compelling member of the alliance. And I think what's important too is... Before he gets to that important point, notice that he said military capacity, not military force, not established military strength, but military capacity. It was that... Um, Finland and the NATO alliance have been working closely together for years. What membership does now is it makes, in a sense, formal what's uh, in many ways been the, been the case for, for a long time, but it also provides Finland with the commitment of every NATO ally to Finland and its security and its defense as a member of NATO and as a beneficiary uh, of Article 5. But I would anticipate that, um, you know, across the board, this has the effect of just further strengthening, deepening relationships, not only between the United States and Finland, but between Finland and all the other members of, uh, of NATO. We also have now even more increasing overlap between membership in the European Union and membership in, in NATO. 
and that too has the uh, effect of, of creating even greater convergence between the United States and Europe than we've seen. In fact, I think in my experience now. All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and stop it right there. I think that we have probably learned as much as we need to from this particular press conference. It does go on for about five more minutes. I'll make sure to put the link in the notes uh, or the description box below. Uh, whatever it is on whatever platform uh, you are viewing this on so that you can check out that last five minutes for yourself if you choose to. But it seems that what they were accomplishing this week was officially bringing Finland into the NATO fold and I guess figuring out how they're going to divvy up the resources that Finland brings to the table in order to be able to forward said resources to the quote unquote war effort uh, in Ukraine. Also, we learned that the next meeting in Vilnius in July is going to, it appears, have a lot to do with the planning for the defense of Ukraine over the course of the remainder of this year, as well as moving into the future. So I think it's probably going to be uh, very important for us to keep an eye on that meeting coming up in the summer here in the Northern Hemisphere. Yeah, I'm still in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, keep an eye on that one as well, as that may be the NATO meeting that is going to have the most immediate repercussions for the uh, conditions of our current shared reality and whether or not we head into full-blown war. Of course, we have three months between now and then where literally anything can happen, and I think we've seen over the course of the beginning few weeks of this year that uh, Clown World has decided to turn the knob up to 11 and just absolutely douse us with as much absurdity as we can possibly handle and in many cases more than we can possibly handle. Um, so a lot to think about there. Let me know what you guys think in the comments as far as what this NATO meeting was all about and what you expect to come from it. And uh, yeah, maybe we'll get back together again and do this all over with a new piece of media as we learn our way forward towards media literacy and uh, protecting ourselves from the scammers and the grifters that are uh, dominating the media space. Uh, in our world at the moment. Uh, thanks for tuning in, and uh, we'll see you guys next time.